Hey, it's Steve. Again, it's still Monday. We're going to do a second segment, and this is on Airbnbs. Um, not, I was never a huge fan of them. Again, I missed the boat. My fault. I know a lot of people made a, a shit ton of money, but obviously uh, we had a different action plan for investments. We wanted to stay more long-term rents and also properties that we can flip and make money or redevelop. So we missed the Airbnb boat. Um, when we were getting into the thinking about it was last year... Um, when we're looking at cottages or even late 21, I just couldn't fathom the amount of money. They were they're like a, a really beat up, shitty ass cottage and what they were a asking for it. And then it's like, OK, it might be good for like one or two months. It's not like like a year round kind of thing, because especially up north, like what do you do in the winter? I know you, some people head up, but ultimately it, it wasn't it didn't make sense to me. Um and I was always saying to people, like, you know, get into, they want to get Airbnbs, and we did sell them to clients. Obviously, we, we gave them with a caveat, like, make sure, and again, always forward thinking, I'm saying, make sure, like, obviously, this property here, yes, you're getting Air, Airbnb money, you're going to make, you know, 40, 50K a year uh, here, like, on a small property. Um, but ultimately, this property can still be leased out to long term to a family, because not only here for tourism, it can be rented out to a family. Or we can sell it as a as a single family dwelling. So if, if we ever had the cash out of this property because of, of an issue, we would. And this is how we sold them with always the cautionary note of the future sale. If I'm a little bit boring like that, I'm even talking to clients that want to buy their dream home in Florida. I'm always talking about the resale before they even buy. But ultimately, you gotta cover your butt, right? Um, so let's have a look now with Airbnb. So so short story short, I'm always saying like. At some point, hotels are gonna are gonna come back. They're gonna backlash because ultimately, let's just say you're uh, Hilton or Spring Hill, whatever these are, Marriott. Like ultimately, look how much infrastructure you have. You own, um, you know, a ton of real estate. You're paying huge taxes because you know, obviously, large parcels of land with the buildings on. You got to maintain that building. You got to maintain a staff. Usually, they're in the union, so you got to pay, you know, benefits and all that stuff. Um, also, just just the overall expenses. And now, if if you, if you, they used to make two, three hundred dollars per night, and now like the neighboring properties charge and even like three, four hundred dollars a night, ultimately in a subdivision you get a, a yard and a whole thing and a few extra bedrooms, and now people can, um, you know, rent with multiple families and offset the expenses. They're gonna lose, so they're gonna fight back at some time naturally. Because if if I was in a hotel industry, I would I would call my counselor, a counselor or whoever's in charge of of the state or city, and start you know ringing an ear like, hey, we we got you voted in. You got to start figuring this out. We got to, or else we're out of business and you're out of politics. So we got to figure this out. Um, so this is the first strike. <laughs> Let's look at what's going on here. So just um. Kind of seeing what's happening now with Airbnbs. Like I kind of was going through some articles today, just to kind of see what what the feeling was, and here it is. So why is Airbnb failing? And and to be honest, I'm a little bit of a germphobe. I don't know who owns this property. I don't know how they clean it, if they clean it. So it's I know when I go to a hotel, it's it's done. People have you know tasks to be completed. They're completed. If not, you can go down, complain to your um, you know, the front desk and ultimately they'll move you around, right, into something that's more suitable for you. Because I kind of like that freedom uh, and cleansiness. But also, these are cool. You know, we use a few of them, but not many, but um, they're cool, naturally. Um, so why is Airbnb failing? So my co colleagues aren't alone. A 2021 study of more than 125,000 Airbnb complaints on Twitter found 72% of the issue were related to poor customer service and 22% related to scams. Listen, I'm a I'm a, a landlord, you know, and I'm a, a damn good landlord. I always respond to my tenants on time. I always get everything done when they call. But that's me. I'm a very proactive person. I, but I know a lot of landlords that don't even take calls from their 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 uh, tenants, and they'll avoid it as as much as they can. Either they don't have the energy to deal with it, or they just don't give a shit. And that's the same thing with Airbnb. Are you really going to give your clients that are paying now extremely high prices for for room rents, like or whatever uh, Airbnb rents? Are you giving them the service that they deserve? Because at the end, um, I think even Tim Dillon made a point of this. He's like, you have to clean your own dishes and bring out your own garbage. It's, it's not a vacation. <laughs> so it's true. You know, it's like being at home. And if, if there was a discounted price where you had to do all these services, fair enough. Then it's okay. Then you can kind of do these things. But if you're paying for your service and you still got to, you know, clean and do a whole bunch of stuff, it's not uh, ideal, especially for a vacation. Um, 
Are Airbnb declining? While many Airbnb users have climbed to see a decline in bookings, a spokesperson for Airbnb maintained that guest demand is high as ever, which is bullshit. Because if you talk to a lot of people that own Airbnbs in very popular destinations, specifically in Florida, not on my end, on the East Coast, they're suffering now with, with the amount of people coming in and leasing. Um, or the, the properties, right? Because there's so many. It's so saturated. You know what I mean? Supply, supply and demand. When when COVID came out, and that was a really COVID a great option because you had gone to an Airbnb. It was great. You had you weren't around, you know, like staff, and you wanted to be alone because you were scared of you know COVID and stuff like that. Airbnbs was a place to go. Now naturally, the world's opened up and people are back into hotels. I think this is what's currently happening. Um, so what's the problem with the Airbnb company? The biggest problem Airbnb hosts deal with is the most common problem in vacation rental hosts deal with uh, are regulations, local laws, parties, excessive turnover, unmanageable guests, not knowing your market and finding better guests. Um, so you kind of jump into this article here by uh, Business Insider. And it's talking about all the different uh, states in America now and cities that have starting to ban and have restrictions uh, going forward on on Airbnbs, not to mention here in Toronto, it's the same thing. I was talking to my coach, and he's got stuff out in Sarnia, and and they're having restrictive laws there too. A client of mine has one in Tobamore; they're in a restrictive law there too. They just got grandfathered in, luckily, but it can't create any more new Airbnbs. So people are specifically cracking down on this. Obviously, if you live in an area like a subdivision you got a family like i don't need my neighbor turning families over every every you know every six to seven days or whatever five days or three days and you know obviously if you're on vacation you're going to come you're going to be rowdy you're going to drink you're going to have a good time and this is if you're raising a family next door it could be troublesome right so what right now they're trying to lean and kind of allocate areas that are going to be more specific to this this type of um short-term rentals or not even at all to be honest because if you kind of see uh, I'll kind of go through some of these states, and then I'm going to stop at a few, um, kind of show you what's happening here, right? Uh, here we go. Let's start. So Colorado, um, again, Alamosa, Colorado. This is, how would they say, it's like 10,000 10, people. Um, and then when, when they come with the travel season and stuff like that, you imagine your neighbors, like, you know. <laughs> It's a disaster. But anyway, we'll keep going. Aspen, Colorado, Atlanta, Georgia. This was an interesting one, Atlanta, Georgia. I read through a few of these, what they're, they're trying to suppress the, um, how do people Airbnb. It's this. So in March 21, Atlanta passed an ordinance to regulate short-term rentals. It requires hosts to pay $150 annual permit, which is very reasonable for the amount of money you can potentially make, and provide a copy of the property's deed and a utility bill to operate a rental Property, the rentals are taxed at 8%, the same as hotels in Atlanta. Violation of the ordinance carries a $300 fine. But look how <laughs> the feeling of some of these councilmen. Uh, I'm trying to stop the city from becoming a de facto hotel city, a city councilman, Antonio Lewis, told the Atlanta Journal. Um, and if you look at the bill, like 13, 13 to 2 were against and have a crackdown on, on what gets airbnb in the area. Um and we'll read further. So what's going to happen is, is that yeah, you're, they're going to say we you'll be allowed to Airbnb, but you got to go through this process. And what they'll do with the process, they'll make it very difficult. And this is for this is one prime example. So the law was scheduled to go into effect in April, allowing hosts to apply for permits the month prior. However, according to an analyst of city permitting data by the Atlanta Journal Constitution, roughly 10% of the city's 7,000. 100 listings apply for permits two months after the application process opened. Less than 3% received permits. So do the math. What's that? 250 to 300 people actually got permits to do Airbnbs. So again, that's imagine that. So if you bought a property purposely, if you bought a property at top dollar, paid over asking, you know, like numbers don't make sense. They only make sense if you Airbnb it. Now they've removed your Airbnb uh right to 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 lease out the property for short-term rent like these are going to be fire sale properties and this is why when i beginning of this video i was talking about how when we sold these uh, type of products to clients we made sure that we can sell them as a, a residential property later because some of these will be more geared toward toward tourism vermont tennessee idaho obviously these are all tourist destinations dallas texas alabama that looks actually quite pretty colorado um, 
Again, another Colorado, part of Colorado, Lexington, Kentucky. Uh, Marco Island, Florida. So this is Southwest Florida. This is my neck of the woods now. And I love my neck of the woods. And I'll tell you why. Because these guys are the law and they'll always be the law. And there's no one that's going to push them around. It is what it is. They're, they're fighting for the citizens and and will always and the citizens will always win. So it's a great place to, uh, to, to be for sure. Um, so let's have a let's read this a little bit here. Um, so voters in Marco Island, Florida, approved an ordinance uh, on August 23rd that created a registration program for short-term rental properties and imposed several new restrictions. After months of debate, it was narrowly approved by the local city council in December. To register a property, short-term rental owners must hold a liability insurance policy of at least a million, which is fair, obviously. Provide city officials with phone number that is answered 24 hours per day and, and a $50 registration fee, which sounds all reasonable. The ordinance was submitted by a group called Take Back Marco, a nonpartisan political action committee. Um, uh, so Take Back Marco told Wink that additional regulations are necessary because short-term rental properties have gone out of control on Marco Island, according to data from Air DNA. There are more than 2,400 short-term rentals, which charge an average daily of $329 per month. Uh, or, or night rather. Uh, vacation property owners have filed a lawsuit to prevent the ordinance from going into effect. David DiPetro, an attorney representing the, the property owners, told Gulf Shore Business in August that the ordinance is overly restrictive. This is where it gets nice. Once this ordinance passes until you receive the certificate from the city, which means you have to have an inspection from the fire department and the city, you can't rent until that's done. DiPetro said, there's there are over 2,000 rentals and there's no one doing the job right now. So we think that it's going to be a ban for an indefinite amount of time. Exactly. So again, Southwest Florida, you don't fool around. They're not going to go out and do these fire inspections. They don't want them. They don't want them. They'll keep it on the east side. Like they wanted more on, on Fort Lauderdale, uh, Miami, Hollywood, that section there. They don't want to have all this stuff here on, on our end here. Look, New York, New York, Hawaii... Palm Springs, California, Palo Alto, um, again, Beach beach Town in, in Michigan, Portland, Maine, Red Hook, New York. So anything that's actually quite pretty to go visit, they're starting to ban. Sarasota, Florida. This was actually really easy. This wasn't too restrictive, to be honest. Um, Georgia... Anyway, kind of going into that, they're 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 going to be cracking down on this going forward, and you're going to see. So, if you have an Airbnb, just be mindful and make sure that you can obviously lease this out to cover all expenses to like long term rents. What we're going to do in Florida specifically with my property will be more seasonal rents. I'm not going to get into the Airbnb game. Uh, I think it's over to be honest. Maybe Cape Coral still has some options there to do it, but ultimately we're going to do seasonal rent, minimum 30 day rentals. It's nice, easy flow. I don't got to worry. Keep changing, changing seven every seven days to change the uh, um, whatever, change change the sheets and all that stuff. There, you do thirty day day rentals. They maintain the property themselves, and away you go. And you'll have maybe, hopefully, maybe six to eight different people per year renting the property out. You still make top dollar, and again, it's a lot less work, and you're not uh, kicking back to uh, another company. So that's pretty much it, guys. Have an amazing day. We'll talk soon. Ciao.